Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Blue Maxima. Welcome back to Blue Boards. This time we're going to be checking out Aeon's End by Kevin Riley. And there are three things that make this game really, really damn good. You've got the variety, whether it be in the marker cards, the mages, or the bosses that you have to fight off. Whether it be the difficulty because of the nemesises and how they're all well balanced but also completely different from each other to provide a different level of difficulty or whether it be the strategy whether it be what you decide to buy what you decide to charge what you decide to open or any combination of the three they all coalesce together really well and create a very well flowing and very very enjoyable deck building game so basic concept breach mages they are defending the city of Gravehold from attack by the Nemesis up there in the top left. And each of the Nemesises can have their own unique attack patterns, but we'll get to how that works a bit later. And so the idea is, you start out with five cards in your hand, you've got five cards in your deck. But even among the Breach Mages, their starting decks are unique, their special abilities are unique, and even the Breaches up the top and how much it takes to open them are unique, giving them all a very different place in certain parts of the game whether it be fighting certain nemesises or playing a certain role so just for example Brahma here starts out with a fair few crystals two sparks and this card here which gives her a little bit more money so it means that she's going to be very money heavy so she'll be able to buy up a lot of spells but then compare that to Caddy over here on the right Caddy has a lot of sparks and an emerald shard, which lets her heal people up a little bit. But she also has, since she has a lot of spells available, her special ability lets her cast two spells in any one breach. Normally, you'd only be able to cast one. So she can pile spells on top of each other. So she's constantly throwing them out there, or at the very least she would if she had the breaches open and the charges on the spell here. Your job each turn is to determine what you're going to do with all of them because you need to spend money to open breaches and open breaches means that you can cast more spells per turn which means you can deal more damage per turn that makes you inherently more effective but you might also want to spend some money on the market cards themselves whether it be spells which of course will do damage and the more powerful spells will do more damage whether they be gems which help increase the amount of money that you make and often add some special abilities on the top and whether it be the relics, which are usually a useful effect, but sometimes some of them will be useful until they're not useful, and then they'll have a second useful effect. Like, for example, the Focusing Orb lets you focus any player's breach, so basically it just means it makes them cheaper to open. But, imagine that that's all done, destroy that and Gravehold gets three life. So it ends up being useful right until the very end. On top of all that, you can spend two crystals in order to get a charge for your mage's personal ability. And all of these choices are a good choice to make, whether it be opening more breaches so you can throw out a hand of four spells when you get them, getting a charge going so that you can use your ability at exactly the right time, or buying something from the market to make your deck just that little bit stronger. It makes every single turn interesting. And even then, there are ways to play around with this concept of buying things at the right time, playing things at the right time, because... When your deck is empty and you need to draw new cards from your deck, you don't shuffle your deck, you just flip the deck over and use that as your new deck. Which means that you can even have a little bit of precision as to where certain cards will end up in your deck. Like for example, I've got two cards here that work really well together. And let's just get that focus fixed up so you can actually see them. So, the Burning Opal and the Oblivion Swell. So the Oblivion Swell does 2 damage, but if you discard a gem, you deal damage equal to its cost. And then the Burning Opal is a gem that costs 5. So if I get those two together, by putting them in the discard pile as close to each other as possible, I can make it so that they'll both come up on the same turn, and therefore I can deal 7 damage over the course of 1 or 2 turns. Or even better, have this come up in one hand, and then have this one come up in the next hand or any amount of little strategies like that that you can think of. And all of these cards most likely have some way to take advantage of that concept, and it's a really clever idea. Only kind of let down by the fact that the cards you end up buying from there end up going straight into the discard pile, 
But then again, since you discard all the cards at the end of your turn, in any particular order, I might add, then you can just figure that out then anyway. But, you know, a little bit of a weird thing to go for, but okay. So as a result, you're always thinking through things as simple as your card positioning. And that just makes your brain go on overdrive because none of these choices are bad. None of them are. And that's what makes it interesting because you're always going to be thinking, is there something better I could have done on this turn? And then the nemesis gets to strike. So up here, up the top, let's just get the camera off the mount for a little bit. Hold it in a way that it won't shiver as much as possible. So up here, you can see the Nemesis. They have currently got eight husks in play, and they'll usually get them through cards that come out of their deck, which is right in the middle of the shot here. And you need to hold them off as much as possible, and there are multiple different kinds of cards. So the purple ones are just engage them, do them immediately, and then they will just hurt. The yellow ones are, they count down to something, and this can be something incredibly painful, like... Gravehold takes half its life in damage, but you can stop some of it by throwing cards away. And then you've got minions, which can come out and cause you some real problems, whether it be the cauterizer that's like, I've got three health, I deal three damage, you can only deal one damage to me per turn, uh, per attack, but the more damage you hit me with, the less I can hurt you. And then you've got like the brood womb over here, which is unique to the carapace queen, which spawns another husk out every turn, but gets protected by any husks that are already out there. So you'll be seeing this combination of basic cards, which usually have things like Unleash, which is unique to every Nemesis. That'll slowly start building up their resources. And then one of their unique cards will pop out, which will cause a massive amount of problems. The game is always keeping you on the back foot. You're always going to have to decide what's worth the effort more. Do I want to be hitting the hitting the carapace queen in the face directly? Do I want to be hitting the minions if I can? Do I want to be taking out the husks? And it's just constantly giving you these choices and you're just hoping that you've made the right one when the next card comes along. It also helps that the game's also got a really nice way of building up the tension and just slowly building up the difficulty. So for the eagle-eyed of you out there who could deal with my hand shaking while I was trying to show you the cards, you might notice that some of them were tier one. But as the deck goes on, it goes down into tier 2 and then tier 3. So each game kind of goes something like this. The, the Nemesis isn't providing much threat, but you don't have much to go off either. So you're both trying to build up your forces as fast as possible. Then, when you get to tier 2, things start to get a bit dangerous. They've built up a lot of their resources. You need to start fighting back. And if you manage to get over that hump where the Nemesis looks like they're going to outpace you and you outpace the Nemesis and you just start throwing out spells left and right, left and right, it becomes genuinely the most satisfying thing to do. But even then, you might not make it. You might be stuck in that sort of second phase forever where both of you are throwing hits back and forth and it's looking like the game can go any way at any minute. And that's also satisfying because my first game of Aeon's End ended with both the mages at one or two health, the Gravehold City at about four or five health, and the monster, we did just enough damage in two turns in order to actually get rid of it. And it was the most satisfying thing imaginable because we made all the right choices. We decided, okay, let's get rid of this thing right away. Let's dump as many of our gems onto this thing. Let's let this thing go for a bit. We know that we, uh, we can last because... Some will deal damage to you, some will deal damage to Gravehold. So you need to keep both of you alive. And if Gravehold is doing really well and you're not, you know you can let something from Gravehold go while you focus on the Nemesis. And vice versa. And again, it's just another layer of strategy that it adds on top. And it's really, really, really well helped out by the Turn Order deck. The Turn Order deck is entirely random. So you have three that can be going into any one deck. This is a two-player game that I'm playing solo, but the, the full deck here is six cards. If it was a three-player game, there'd be a wild, which would be like, hey, you can pick whichever uh, Breach Mage wants to go at this point. And if it was a four-player game, it'd be one, two, three, four, and then two for the Nemesis, because there's always two for the Nemesis. You start the game by shuffling this deck. And so... The turn order deck can come up like this. So four players get to go in a row, but then the nemesis gets to go twice. Then you reshuffle the deck. Imagine what happens if two more nemesises come off the top. 
you are going to be flattened. But it's still really damn fun when it happens. Or when the game is just nice and generous enough to you to let you prep like four turns worth of spells on one turn and then gives you another turn right off the bat. Or it just ends up being an absolutely crazy mess where everyone is just getting goes at any time and it just kind of just goes off the rails. Like, for example, like, say, something like this. One Nemesis 1, two Nemesis 2, where it's just, Jesus, how do you even figure out what to do at that point? But it has just a little la layer of craziness to it. And I really do appreciate what this turn order deck adds to it. You really do need to think ahead about when you're going to get your next turn. What's going to happen if that power really trips down? And the best thing is, after a point, you can start predicting when the turns are going to come up. So, for example, say that two Nemesis cards and a one Nemesis card and two Player 2 cards come up. You know that Player 1 is going to get one of those turns, but you don't know when. And it's great. It's, it's such a tense thing, flipping over the next card and being like, am I going to be able to get my spells off, set off my ability and bring back my other Breach Mage fella from the pit? Am I going to be able to get the resources necessary to get rid of a power card that'll take out Gravehold in one turn? Am I going to be able to survive for long enough to get the damage in? It's, it's so good. It adds so much tension. Fighting the Carapace Queen is completely, completely different from fighting any of the other bosses. All four of them are completely unique and play with the game in completely different ways. And that's why I'm, I'm enjoying the game as much as I am, because it reminds me of something like Hostage Negotiator, where in the base box you had three um, abductors, and two of them were basically the same, and one of them just had a very little change to how the gameplay worked. This game does it completely differently. So as I was saying before, the Carapace Queen gets these husks, and, and they build up. And from time to time, the Carapace Queen will swarm, and when she swarms, it does certain effects. And if they build up too much, it'll end the match. So you need to be attacking those husks in order to take them down. And usually you can only hit one target. But if you willingly drain yourself of one life, it means that you can hit multiple with one attack. Which is why someone like Brahma or Cadia's starter card come in really useful. Because you can be healing that up. You can make that work for you. But... That strategy isn't going to work at all when you're faced with Rageborn. Because Rageborn has their own unique strike deck, which they pull an attack from that you just can't stop if it gets pissed off enough. And you have to work your way around that deck. You have to think, okay, how uh, difficult is it going to be to deal with? Do we need to worry about anything particular this turn? And then you've got someone like the Crooked Mask, who barely attacks you or Gravehold directly, but instead inserts corruption cards into your deck. And these corruption cards do damage to you and give you like tiny little benefits to make up for the fact that you've just lost a card to the um, draw of the corruption card. But when the corruption starts running out, when you have an absolute ton of corruption in your deck and you're drawing two or three of them a turn and it's getting absolutely floored, it completely changes the way the game works. And then the game completely changes again with the Prince of Gluttons where it actually gets rid of cards in the supply piles up to the top right there via draining them away into its own pile. And if all of those piles go away, you lose. So you need to be really charitable about what you decide to take from those piles because this turn's resource might end up being the last turn's old oh crap that just saved me from losing the game completely. It makes you think about every battle in each unique individual way. And all of the different Breach Mages, each with their own unique abilities, can work really well with this too. Uh, like, for example, you don't know what Rageborn is going to do this turn, right? Uh, where is it? Where are you? There we go. So you don't know what Rageborn might do because he's going to do a strike, right? Pull out Vedraxa. Use his special ability. Prevent any damage that the players or Gravehold would suffer during that turn. That would work fantastically for that. Uh, you want to deal with the fact that uh, a bunch of your cards are corruption? Why not draw four more from your deck? Might run into a couple more corruptions, but what are you going to do, right? And there are so many ways you can play around with all of these, uh, these Breach Mages, all of these Nemeses, and all of these market cards. Because there are nine market cards up there, but in the game in total, there are 27 sets of cards. So... You can choose to either pick one from the manual, they give you a few that are beginner friendly, 
or you can choose to randomize them entirely like I've done here. And it really keeps you looking out for some really interesting combinations. It keeps you looking out for how the breach mages the game picked out randomly and the cards the game picked out randomly can be used together to take out the nemesis randomly because there was one spell card in particular which is like, hey, if there is a spell in an adjacent breach, you add two damage to this spell. And so, I took a bunch of those with KD. I set off KD's special ability, which is take three spells from your discard pile, put them back into your hand. You may now cast two spells in one breach for this turn only. So, I put those two uh, adjacent ones onto those breaches and then put two more spells on top of that. So I did something like 24 damage on one turn, and it was enough to knock out. Funnily enough, it was the Carapace Queen I was fighting at the time. So the game's got a ton of variability in there. And there is a nice thing that they actually do here, right? So they've got randomizer cards. And these randomizer cards, they're one copy of each of the spells, gems, and relics that are included in the game, so you can just use it to build a random market set. I just use an app on my phone to do it, but I appreciate the user friendliness going on here. It just works out. It, it just, it, it makes an interesting fight every time. Random mages, random ones of those. But I also appreciate that the game says, hey, you don't have to follow our suggestion. You can make whatever setup you want. You can build any sort of strategy you want to go with. And I do appreciate that because it lets you try out your own strategies it lets you just play around with the way that the game works it lets you try and break it and so yeah it's just really really good it does an absolutely fantastic job of being an, an interesting deck builder the difficulty is actually really interesting because all of these have their own difficulty levels to defeat i beat the carapace queen i beat rageborn but these two Beat the crap out of me. They're both difficulty 5. Uh, Carabas Queen is difficulty 3 and Rageborn is difficulty 2. It does such a good job at building up that tension. Making it so that the power curve is believable and reasonable. It does a good job at adding variety to the game through all of the Nemesis as being really different. The turn order deck coming out different every time. The way that the Nemesis deck there is built up with a new threat coming off the top every turn a new potential thing, whether it be just a basic one that gives you just this thing you need to worry about, or something specific to this boss, which gives you even something even more worrying to worry about. The strategy, whether it be knowing whether you need to open a breach, gain something from the supply, charge up your special ability because it's going to be needed, whether it be deciding whether or not you're going to take the damage, Gravehold is going to take the damage, or which mage is going to take the damage for that matter, depending on the nemesis you're fighting and the way things are coming out. And just the variety in the way things can come out because of the potentially randomizing your entire thing or being able to build it yourself, uh, choosing what mages you're going for. Hell, the way the nemesis deck is built. So each nemesis has got nine unique cards that you merge in with some basic cards to create the deck. So you're always going to be seeing a different battle every time. Some things are going to happen the same way every time, since all of the Nemesis cards that are unique to them will always end up in the Nemesis deck. But it gives them just that little bit more flavor. It makes them just that little bit more interesting, and therefore it's just a flat-out positive. So it changes the way the battle goes down every time. It's just, it's so good. It's so, so good. And I am more than happy to recommend Aeon's End to pretty much anyone. I mean, it's difficult, and you're not going to win every game, and you might be a bit frustrated while you're trying to learn the strategy. But even then, in the box, they give you, they separate the decks in such a way so that they give you, like, what might be the easiest game you can have just to start off with in order to really get up to speed with how the game works. And there's even just, like, little things. Like, they do have, like, player aid cards that tell you how things go down. But they also have just on the back here the one thing you probably want to keep referencing the, the manual for, which is, hey, how many cards do I add to the Nemesis deck for how many players I've got? It, it just, it, it's so well done. It's really, really well done. And I wholeheartedly recommend it. It's a bit difficult. It might kick your ass. But it's sublime. It does a fantastic job.
I'll be back next week to talk about the expansions to this box. <laughs> because of course I will be. This has been Blue Maxima. I'll see you all next time.